Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. In this lecture, the last of week five, we're going to be talking about the detectors for gas chromatography. And really, it's going to be a quick lecture because most of this is sort of what you're going to use when, but there's a lot of options available. And most GCs that you purchase will have a couple of these detectors uh, tacked onto them so that they can do kind of a wide range of. So the detector is really the end of the block diagram. And as things are coming off the column, maybe it's a 0.2 mil per minute flow rate, maybe more, you have to actually figure out where your analyte is. And so your detectors need to be fast because you're going to have fast flow rates for GC. They have to be able to see relatively small nanogram amounts of material, and they need to respond quickly on the order of a second. Those are, are, those are pretty tall orders for a lot of detectors. And so the development of detector technology has really gone hand in hand with the development of those really narrow small columns, because those small columns don't give you much material to detect. So again, you have to get both things working well in order to get extremely high resolution separations. There's really two endpoints for, I think, GC detectors. One would be the flame ionization detector, and then the other is the mass spec. Those are, in my experience, the most common ones you'll find in research laboratories. But as you'll see, there's a lot of different options. These are the most common detectors um, for gas chromatography systems. There's many others, but I sort of limited to these. And when you're selecting a detector for, for GC, your sort of go-to detectors are going to be the ones that are called the universal detectors. And that's going to be a flame ionization detector and a thermal conductivity detector, these top two rows. And in both of those cases, they are kind of universally sensitive to just about any analyte that's not the mobile phase. Sounds great, right? But they also have some downsides. The thermal conductivity just doesn't have the detection limits. And the FID can have a challenge detecting carbonyls and carboxyl functionalities. So, and its detection limit isn't all, all that spectacular anyhow. So the bottom four are ones that are a little bit more specific to particular types of compounds. So electron capture detectors are great things to use if you want to detect halides. I mean, check out the detection limit. It's like a femtogram detection limit. So it's really spectacular, for example, for ultra-trace detection of various halogenated toxic system, toxic materials in water. And of course, flame photometric and photoionization detectors as well. Those are kind of specialized systems, though, and they're ones that you wouldn't use in a really robust sense. But I wanted to put them up there so that if you did, for example, need to design a GC lab that measured the same thing over and over and over again, then you might not need such a universal detector, and you might invest in a detector that would lower your detection limits for a particular type of compound that you were interested in. OK, so I would say the workhorse of most GC systems out there today is the flame ionization detector. So an FID, as it's also known, is a detector that takes what's coming off of the column, and it mixes it with both hydrogen and air, and then it ignites it. So it's basically a tiny little explosive device tacked onto your gas chromatography system. And as these, so as these molecules are coming off the column, and they enter this sort of little mini bomb, they're going to, in some cases, create ions. And those ions are going to actually impinge on an electrical circuit that will actually generate a current as a function of the number of ions that hit it. And so that ionization process is really how you, how you sort of initiate the detection process. And that's going to be really, really insensitive to the chemical nature of the materials coming off of the column. And it's also going to be really, really sensitive. So FIDs are great systems with really good enough detection limits to work with capillary columns over a wide, wide range of organic systems. And they're robust and easy to use. Of course, they do destroy the sample. And there are some cases where you'd like to collect the material coming off the column. But that's generally a kind of specialized concern. Another type of detector, which in fact was used before the FID, is a thermal conductivity detector. Like the FID, it's a universal detector. It's going to work with just about every organic compound out there. And how it works is actually a little bit simpler. Um, it uses something called a thermistor, which is basically a, a wound up wire, usually an inert metal. And a th thermistor's resistance depends on the temperature of the surrounding media. And so as the temperature of the wire goes up and down, you actually measure changes in its resistance. And in this case, the gas that surrounds this wire actually has a large impact on the temperature of the wire because gases can change the thermal conductivity and how much energy is exiting into the mobile phase 
where the analytes are or not. So thermal conductivity detectors are really robust, they're relatively compact, and they're going to work great if you have a packed bed column or for whatever reason a wide bore column where you have a lot of material coming out. They're kind of less common these days because the use of capillary columns has put a much more stringent detection limit requirement on detectors, one that thermal conductivity detectors really can't meet. But as I said, they're kind of robust, really hard to break, much simpler than the FID that you just saw. So often you'll just go ahead and get a thermal conductivity detector for a mass spec because it's usually a small price and of course you never know, maybe you'll want a really rugged kind of detector if you were running, for example, a pretty wide bore column. Okay, well the granddaddy of detectors for gas chromatography systems is of course the mass spectrometer. GCMS is a really amazing tool and I hope to be able to give you an example to see that in action next week. But in a GCMS you do chromatography but you get to do the mass analysis of each peak you see. So there's absolutely no question about the molecular identity of the peaks that come off the column. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. And so you basically take the column comes off the column and you run it through a mass spec or you use magnetic fields to deflect the trajectory of ions and through that measure the ion current in the detector of the mass spec. They're substantially more expensive devices, much more complicated devices to run. You have to be very careful not to contaminate the inside of a GCMS because remember it's pumped down. Uh, so it's got a lot of the complexities that we saw with the ICP MS for atomic analysis. But for example, as shown in this image, if you get a peak in a chromatogram and you have no idea what the chemical identity is, you can run a mass spec, you can take just that window, just that one, and figure out a lot about what you've got in the sample. So it's a really, really powerful tool and one that we'll talk a lot more about. So that pretty much wraps up this week. Um, you've been introduced to gas chromatography, had a little bit more theory with respect to plate height and understanding the Van Diemter equation. Uh, we've talked about how to select a column for GC and you'll do some more uh, practice work on that in the quizzes this week and we sort of gone through the various systems in a GC. Thanks so much. See you next time.